Welcome to part three of the Python and SQL series I'm doing. This is the last part. This is going to get into a more in-depth approach to using SQL. So as I mentioned, I'm big on parsimony. And the goal here is to sort of take the, I've layered this. So the easiest way was the first presentation. The second way was, a, we'll call it the Buddhist middle path way, um, something in between. And this is a little more robust, a little more work, but gives you a lot more power and flexibility. Uh, my name is Brian Kafke. Probably should tell you that. And as usual, I'm drinking out of my Enterprise mug here, Star Trek, and wearing my window shirt. Actually, as you probably can see, I don't wear the same clothes every day. I'm, I'm actually doing these videos in chunks, um, all at the same time, so that like the Lord of the Rings three movie series at the beginning, by doing it all in one shot, if you know that, uh, it came out better. So I'm hoping this follows like that. All right, so let's jump in. Again, my name is Brian Kafke, and you can find the content on github.com slash bkafke slash shared. Look under Python SQL, and you'll find it there. So we're going to talk about querying a full-scale database management system, as opposed to what we've talked about in the prior two discussions, which is just querying things and using data frames and pulling out CSV files, or using SQLite. We did talk a little bit about using Postgres with, with SQLite, which does let you get a full DBMS open source. But now I want to look at something, working for Microsoft and having worked for decades with SQL Server, I want to look at that. I always kind of come back to SQL Server and I say, how do I work with that in this environment? Nice nice thing is, while 10 years ago, uh, SQL Server's support within Python was not the greatest, it's really come a long way. They have good drivers now. There's more first-class support for SQL Server. So it's very good to see that. So we're going to be using ODBC, the Open Database Connectivity, which is an open standard to connect to the databases. That's actually something, if I remember correctly, a couple of decades ago, Microsoft came up with that. Around um, using SQL Server and Microsoft Access, they started trying to find a way to kind of create a standard for this, and open database connectivity became the standard. Offshoots of that are things like JDBC, which came much later, and things like that. But it's, it, the nice thing is it's a standard says, if you write to this, this protocol, this standard API, then you can work with ODBC and it's a plug and play kind of thing. So there's drivers for ODBC for like Oracle and Postgres and MySQL and SQL Server and DB2 and you name it. So it's a really nice thing to have ODBC and that's what we're going to use here. Python, as I mentioned, favors Postgres the most of any database and probably MySQL second to Postgres in what I've seen, especially when you think of things like Django. A, a, this will offer us a production grade solution and maximum flexibility. And I'll, I'll add to that, DBAs in particular, and a lot of DBAs, and one of the things that they they don't like to see is poorly performing queries in the database. So this approach is gonna use ODBC to send queries directly through. You do have to watch out for things, so watch out for parameterization things because you can get SQL injection attacks. There's lots of things around this. This is strictly meant to be, again, more data analysis orientated. But if you're looking to do more robust, I still think SQL is a good way to go. Just be careful. Use stored procedures on the back end and things if possible, things that will sort of, you can protect. The thing that DBAs typically like about using something like direct SQL is it's a lot easier opt to optimize. When you use ORMs, Objects Relationship Managers, or Relational Managers, like uh, SQL Alchemy, that will generally, people use the ORM side of that. You get a lot of performance issues off, often because it's generating SQL for you and oftentimes the SQL it generates is not very performant. So let's jump in and I'll demonstrate this approach. So again, this is a notebook out there. It's Jupyter Notebook, we're using Jupyter. If you're not familiar with it, I have a video, so go check it out, look online. Jupyter is a browser-based way of interacting. It's a, a analysis to really an IDE, but it uses these cells to execute as we'll see. And it's really good for teaching like this because you can kind of do chunks of things and the output of your commands displays in flow right below it. So it's easy to teach things. So that's why I like it for this. Um, and we're going to be looking again, this diagram kind of shows you Python interacting with a database management system. Okay. In this case, we're going to be importing PyODBC. So that's the ODBC library to go with Python. Good old pandas. And we're going to create, in this case, we're going to start with Postgres. We can, we'll can we show other examples, but Postgres is where I'm starting. And we need to have an ODBC driver. So if you don't have an ODBC driver installed, you can go online and, you know, look for it, Bing it or whatever, and find the driver that fits, you know, Python space ODBC and then whatever database, you know, probably find one. Postgres is, is right here. I have this installed. 
and the server name, I need to give it, how do I connect to it? So I'm giving all the information, trusted connection, yes, user ID and password. Now what I'm doing here is um, I'm, I'm putting all this in here. Again, this isn't terribly secure. You're gonna have to find in your environment how to protect that password. If I was doing PowerShell, they have a, a whole thing for a credential object that encrypts it and everything, it makes it more secure. But find a way to do it, but I'm just gonna show you the basics here. And then I'm gonna create my query in a string. This is a doc string because it could go with multiple lines because I'm using three quotes as opposed to single quotes. And then I'm going to use pandas to pass this query through just like we saw earlier. I think it was my first video actually. Um, and I can pass a connection through. I mean my second actually to do this. And that'll go into a data frame. Then I'm gonna print the first three rows of the data frame out and I'll print what is that? Make sure confirm it really is a data frame. So a lot going on there. Probably take a minute. So you can see there's my three rows and it tells me that this is in fact a pandas data frame. So there's a lot going on here and it's it's pretty cool to think what you're doing. You're actually able to use an ODBC connection, query the database, and using pandas, we can return this as a data frame. I'm very data frame focused because again, it's analysis, but you can do other things if you wanna just do statements and not necessarily pull everything back as a data frame because there can be issues with that for memory, et cetera. All right. Now I'm gonna use SQL Server Native Client, which is kind of interesting because that's not typically what you think of as an ODBC driver, but seems to work. So here I'm gonna do the same type of thing, create a connection. Again here, um, let me go back up here for a minute, use pandas, but here we're not using pandas. We're just gonna use a raw ODBC connection. And this would be useful, if, especially if I just wanted to do maybe updates and things like that, and I'm not interested in querying. Notice it's similar to my last video, if you saw it, where we create first a connection, and then a cursor. So the connection gets us to the database. The database could be anywhere. It could be out and it could be an Azure cloud, it could be on a server in our environment, it could be anywhere. So this information tells us, okay, this is a server and on that server here's the database. And so it has a way to find it. Sometimes you'll see it actually have the IP address. If it's like in the cloud or somewhere else, it's not local, then you'd have to have an IP address to get to it. But this is the basic driver information. And then I can run a select here and by doing this, I'm able to loop through my cursor, as you see, and, and let me walk through this first, I'll run it. And so what I'm actually doing is I'm saying cursor executes, so cur uh, excuse me, I'm establishing my cursor here, and here I execute the cursor, which is my select statement. And now that I have my cursor, I can loop over it using Python, just loop over the cursor and print out row equal, and then it dumps out all the data. Now looking at this, it looks like it's returning tuples because of the parentheses. Um, row. So it's not a data frame and I don't necessarily need to do data frames unless I'm doing analysis. So let's step down here and now we'll get into something that is more data frame-ish, pandas. We'll do what we've done before, but now we're using, instead of these, the SQL drive we're using, I'm just gonna switch over to the ODBC for SQL driver. And again, the same basic information I'm gonna be pulling out of AdventureWorks person dot person and um, yeah query here etc my query is just select very similar to before and my connection so my connection is here connection gets me to the database and since I'm using pandas I'm not even going to create a cursor that's kind of handled for me and let's run this and we'll get an idea what we see so we can say now we can say df had three you can see I've got three rows returned to me so it's giving me the data and this is actually data as well and at the bottom you can see, yep, it's a pandas data frame. So what I'm doing here is I'm able to use uh, pandas with ODBC, and now I can use that flexibility to query pretty much any database I want and use it as a pandas data frame so I can sort and slice and dice and do all the kinds of things I wanna do. Okay, that seems to be, let's see, did I do anything different? Okay, so the difference between these, by the way, if you notice in this particular connection, I didn't give it a user ID and password. And that's because I'm using Windows authentication or integrated authentication, as it's called in SQL Server, which is a really nice feature of SQL Server if you're in a Windows environment using Active Directory, because all it has to really do is validate, is this really Brian? And yes, it's Brian. And does Brian have authority to do these things in the database? It's like, yes, he does, or no, he doesn't and it's taken care of. 
it's nice because passing credentials around user ID and passwords is a really dangerous practice. Um, you got to do it sometimes, but it's it's not something you, you have to take it very seriously because that's how people get hacked. So in this case, I'm using a less secure approach, which you would use in most databases, and you have to pass user ID and password. So I would recommend, you know, not typically just passing clear text around user IDs, but at least I can demonstrate how you can do it if you need to do that. Um, you may be able to get, and I, I'm very cautious because there's two worlds of working. There's working in analysis. You're doing your own analysis at your local machine, et cetera. It may not be such a big deal to do some of this, but if you're going to do anything like an application, which is going to be running outside the firewall or let anybody in, you particularly have to be careful of this kind of thing. So even here, I would actually prompt the user. Instead of doing this, I would prompt them and say, what's your password, and not show it and things like that. All right. So we're going to do another one. Again, we're going to use SQL Server, and we're going to do a query, and we're going to use read SQL to create a data frame, etc. And we'll see that what's the object type again, just to confirm it is that. And this way, again, is not using user ID and password, but the second connection is putting the user ID and password in, and just run it. We'll see what we get. So we're just outputting, and we can see we've got this. And here we have the object type is, in fact, a data frame and just print it out. I didn't bother printing both of what type they are, but they're both data frames. So you can just, again, kind of see this. You do have flexibility, just kind of point out. I can do notice key thing here. Because it's ODBC, it's passing a query to the database, we can use the native SQL. We don't, have to, we don't use the limit, we use the T SQL statement, top. So we can say top two. So that's one of the things, which means we can also use other sort of native T SQL things. It's one of the pros of not just using SQLite, we can use things a little more native. Um, and here we can pull different things in. We can still do the name things, adjust the name of the columns. So another way to do this, I mentioned showed functions earlier. If you're going to do a lot of interaction with a database, I would probably externalize this, to be honest. I wouldn't put it in my notebook necessarily, but I'd probably externalize it to a script that I could run. Or you could make it a separate notebook that you can execute the notebook from this notebook and it would just create this function. Because there's a lot of parameters you're going to pass. So one of the things I'm doing just to make this easier for myself is I'm putting the driver in and the server as parameters, but I'm also defaulting them. This is a way to default the parameters. And that way I don't have to keep going back. And this particular one is the integrated security because you notice know, it says IS. So I'm writing a function get database data, db data integrated security, give it the SQL statement, which isn't defaulted, obviously, uh, but all these other ones are defaulted. So I can just call it and it will do what I want. And I don't have to keep typing this information, the value of the driver, et cetera, over and over again. Again, drivers change, variables change, names of service change. You don't want to have this hard coded values all over the place, you create a function. And, um, you know, and then your life becomes easier because they say, oh yeah, we decided to rename, you know, Let's say you followed a lot of the same server names. I remember this happened in a company. They had Frodo, they had Bilbo, and they had Middle Earth. And these are servers, real things. And they said, yeah, we're moving from Bilbo to Frodo. And uh, so I had to change all my code. Don't want to have to get caught there. So let's uh, run this to define this function. And then we'll just do a little test of it. We're going to say get DB data, select top three from dim date. I know, real robust table there. Uh, and you can see it, it worked. So, you know, feel free to, to take this. Just be aware I'm not giving any validation that this code is perfect, et cetera. You know, check it, make sure it fits your standards, et cetera. But this is an idea of how you can use things. Okay, so this is the same idea, only I'm hard coding passwords. Really bad practice. But again, I just want to show that, like, in a, a database authentication mode, which SQL Server would support, you would have to have these things. I wouldn't really default password, you know. Let me... I think I can do this. Don't do this. Uh, I don't know if it's going to like the. Yeah, let's try. Hopefully that'll work. But I want to say, don't do this at home. You know, but I just want to show you how this can work. And then the same idea. So it's really doing the same thing, but this time it's it's taking the user ID password. And now I can create this more elaborate just to show you can do all kinds of things. So here I'm. Taking the category name and renaming it, um, using aliases from here to get different tables. Um, since I'm using AdventureWorks, I'm using Fact Internet Sales, which is from AdventureWorks and Dim Product. 
and I can use the aliasing and you can see I'm joining etc I'm doing all kinds of joins and all these things and because it is going through ODBC you can do outer inner joins all the things that are supported by that so you you're good to go and I'm gonna run this um, yeah I'll run this I'm gonna run the same query since it's in this SQL using both methods both functions and they both work you can also do the same thing because now notice I'm using the exact same function with Postgres but here I'm overriding the parameters so that I can run this so and I, I do this a lot like so maybe I have something like 90% of the time I'm using SQL Server and every now and then it's Oracle well when I want to do Oracle maybe I just do one offs and I override the parameters to do that so a lot of ways you can run this run that and notice I'm putting the result in DF date so it is being returned as a data frame I believe and there it is okay so a lot of information there and I hope you reflect on it this is just meant to show you like this is how you would really work with commercial or large production database systems or at least more scalable database systems if you're doing my warnings I'll put all around it is if you're really doing production systems then be very careful about what you're doing here write functions tightly do not put clear text passwords etc it's a bad practice even user IDs unnecessarily don't do that don't hard code things in actual functions but I wanted to again convey the content if you're doing stuff where you're doing analysis you're on your machine have some judgment there again I would not put a password ever 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 in the real thing I'm deleting this database even on my own, own machine because I'm putting passwords in here so be careful with that I wouldn't actually put passwords but you're gonna have to put a password in so I just kind of made it easier on myself to demo it what you probably do in that case if you're on a local machine is just prompt yourself for the password enter it in um, there is a way I have to remember what it is but you can have it not reflect back the values you're typing so that nobody could look over your shoulder you want to be careful with passwords all right so please oh one other thing I do want to talk about it I did not talk about is the thing that shall not be spoken or the name that shall not be spoken which is SQL Alchemy I actually probably will do some other videos on SQL Alchemy it's really a cool product it's a it's a cool package that gives you all kinds of functionality in Python it's a very interesting thing uh, I've got the book right here which I like it's a little pricier and it's like $27 but SQL Alchemy I like the book it's uh it, it does a nice job just basically covering how to use it what it is but SQL Alchemy's number one feature is the ORM it's the object relationship manager relational manager and it's it's good it that allows you to use classes and functions to sort of work with the database so it's very Python based and you don't have to get into SQL and passing SQL statements back and forth and so and but it actually does support three modes so you can do the ORM mode or you can just use <clears throat> a sort of SQL like language where it's functions or methods within it that will use S selects and filters and it has a, an API a way to actually pass through direct queries etc so there's a lot of flexibility there but if you're going to just do SQL then I think SQL Alchemy is overkill and if you're going to use the ORM be careful because you can have some performance issues I need to look more into it but I've seen some videos other people presenting and they do critique some of the places where you can get into some poor performance issues because anytime you have something like an ORM it's going to be generating SQL behind the scenes because at the end of the day databases only speak SQL so you have to watch about scale and will it support things etc it is very popular so but it because of its complexity and, and range of things it would have to be covered in a separate topic so if people are out there really interested in me talking about SQL Alchemy put comments down let me know subscribe and we'll see what happens there so thank you and until next time